Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Nolutando Nematswerani. I'm welcoming you on behalf of Discovery, SAMA, UFFP, and SAPPF. Uh, we have reinstated uh, this uh, series of webinars uh, as in response to the third wave. Last week was our first webinar and we saw more than 1,100 um, 1, attendees, which was a very good response. I think today we are discussing a very interesting and important topic and we are hoping that you, know, you will be uh, participating with us today. In support of the national vaccine rollout, healthcare professionals who have not had the opportunity to vaccinate can now register for vaccinations at one of the national discovery vaccination sites. Uh, details will be outlined in communication due to be circulated in support of this over the next few days, as well as in our next webinars in uh, next week's webinar invitation. Uh, just some house rules before we start. The webinar is CPD accredited. Uh, certificates take about a week uh, to be ready. If you've got any queries, uh, please send them to cpd at discovery.co.za. Um, all webinars are made available on the Discovery website under the tab for healthcare professionals. Uh, please, uh, you know, ask your questions during the webinar um, use the Q&A button, not the chat button. And uh, we usually get uh, very high volumes of, 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 of questions and comments. So we usually try and thin them so that we can get our speakers to address them as best as we can. Today, uh, we are addressing a, a very important topic, which is really focusing on the Delta variant, which we are all very anxious about, but we've got the expertise uh, to come and unpack what this Del Delta variant is about. So joining us today, are, you know, we've got two uh, esteemed speakers, Professor Tulio de Oliveira, who you will know very well, who is the director of the KwaZulu-Natal Research and Innovation Sequence Platform, um, he is the research professor in the College of Health Sciences at the UKZN University and the pr principal investigator of the Network for Genomic Surveillance uh, in South Africa. He is joined by Dr. Richard Lessels, uh, who is a senior infectious diseases, diseases specialist at uh, the University of KwaZulu-Natal uh, Research and Innovation Sequencing uh, Platform. Um, we are welcoming back uh, for the third time, uh, uh, you know, during our webinar series. So you will remember they came um, in, during the first wave to unpack uh, the St. Augustine's, uh, you know, outbreak. Uh, they came back uh, during the second wave to speak about the beta variant, and they are back uh, today to talk to us about the Delta variant. Um, so we, we're hoping that uh, the next time we call them back, it will be on a different note. So Prof. Uh, uh, Tulia and uh, Richard, we really welcome you and I'm going to hand over to you to take us through uh, the, the content that you've prepared for us today. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nolatando, and, and thank you for all the 1,200 people that joined this webinar, yeah. I hope you, you are really taking attention to the, to the talk, not just one to your CPD points. Yeah. And of course, it is, it's great to be back because one thing that both Richard and I, we, we really value eh, is talk to, to frontline clinicians and nurses eh, because we think that's, that's where the, the main response should lie. Yeah. We, we are sorry that is the, the third time that we bring you bad news. But as we, we like to say, we have to know our enemy if we, if we are to fight it. Yeah. So today, what we're going to be, be doing to you is an update on the Delta and other variants in South Africa. Yeah. It's a very moving field. Yeah. To be honest, uh, we, we only detect the Delta variant at very high prevalence in the last, in the last seven days. And, and we had a lot of work to do, not only to communicate with clinicians, nurses, public health officials, governments, yeah, which, which, which we find that's very important uh, to highlight like some of the scientific facts as we come to our third wave, because that may have may really help to understand how the wave is spreading, but also to more important design good interventions. Yeah. 
So today, uh, Richard and I, we will be talking not only for ourselves, but in behalf of the Network for Genomic Surveillance in South Africa, which, which, which the website is below. And that's a network that's funded by the Department of Science Innovation and involved the NHLS, UCT, Stellenbosch, University of Free State, CRISPR, UKZN, WITS, and Pretoria. So, so it's quite impressive that you could put a whole network together to try to, 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 to really do real-time genomic surveillance. Yeah. So if we move to the next slide, then we, we normally always like to start with, uh, with, with highlighting what, what's the epidemic curve. Yeah. And, and of course, many of you is, is, is very aware, everyone is following very much the epidemic curve. So here in, in the, in the x-axis, we have time, in the y-axis, we have daily case, and, and which, which in, in the black line, we have weekly excess deaths. And, and we everyone know that we, we got to a very fast and spreading epidemic. But what we want to highlight is that, is that red line there in the middle, yeah? And that red line is what we call the reproductive number. What it means, it means that normally when the reproductive number is above one, which has been South Africa for at least four or six weeks, eh, we went at a phase of exponential growth of the pandemic. Yeah. And that's what we have seen initially in Houteng, but now it's spreading to the whole provinces. Eh? And if we don't bring that number below on one, this, this is going to just increase very, very, very fast. So at the moment, we are in an exponential phase of the pandemic. Yeah. And then if you we, we go to the next slide, so just to highlight that what we are doing here, we have set up uh, initially six, but now uh, eight labs yeah, around the country yeah, that's always partner with uh, NHLS laboratory, but also partner with, with uh, private labs. For example, here at CRISP at UKZN, we also get a lot of samples from, from, from NETCAM and from UNPAT and from MDS. And the idea is to have all these labs distributed around the country, which we can really do like very quick genomic surveillance close where the sample is collected. Eh? So we have a, a lab in, in KZN, another one in the Free State with the University of the Free State, two in the Western Cape with both uh, Cape Town and Stellenbosch. Yeah. And just for the record that today I start a professorship position at Stellenbosch. So we're gonna be developing a new institute between UKZN and CRISP and Stellenbosch. And we like to joke, one of the most difficult things is to make Stellenbosch and UCT work together. So if we can get them both work together, we can all work in a network with also involve the NICD, Universe of Pretoria and WITS. And, and, and this network, what they have been doing is, is genomic surveillance for a while. When I say for a while, we, we start doing genomic surveillance around the end of February last year. To be honest, we sequenced the first case, the first contact case in South Africa. And here, what we are showing to you is two graphics. Uh, the, the top one is the absolute number of genome counts. And the bottom one is the proportion of genomes through time. And then in the X line, we, we see the, the time starting February and coming now to, to, to June, yeah? And then in the colors, what they represent, when we have a gray line, it means that we have so many lineages that, that like 10, 20, or 30, that's none of them is dominating the epidemic. And then what we saw in the beginning end of last year, which, which coincident with our second wave, uh, is the domination of one variant, which we identify and we initially called the 501.v2, but it got renamed that the, the WHO as the beta variant. And that has completely dominated our second wave, yeah, until the appearance very, very recently of a new variant the Delta variant. And the Delta variant, what it did since um, beginning of May is really increasing in prevalence. And now, unfortunately, displacing the Beta variant, and you're gonna understand why is displacing the Beta variant, and Richard will bring more information, it's a much more transmittable variant, but also starting to completely dominate all our infections. Yeah? 
And this Delta variant is originally from, from India, or we don't know it's from India, was identified in India. And is now it's, it's really spreading really fast. Yeah. So if you're showing this graphic here on the y-axis, we have the different provinces in South Africa, in the x-axis, the time. Yeah. So what we can show very clear is this continuous genomic surveillance that we have been doing in the country, especially in the three big provinces, yeah, of course, Natal, Hauteng, and Western Cape and also trying to, to, to survey some of the other province. And as you can see very clear until May this year, we have a completely domination of the beta variant with the appearance of the other variants, both the alpha that cause infections in Europe and the UK in the second wave, but more and more being completely dominated by the green one, what's the Delta variant. Unfortunately, when, when we present yesterday, uh, last week for our government and in national uh, TV, we only had data from, from KwaZulu-Natal, very detailed. But in the last four days, we complete data from Houteng, Western Cape, Limpopo, and Eastern Cape. And what we're going to try to show you in the next slides is how not only the increase of prevalence of this variant is closely associated with increasing cases. Yeah. So if we get a look in our first province, in, and it's the one that everyone was most interested in, the Houteng, yeah. So in the black line in the middle there is the average number of seven days rolling average number of cases. And as you see, it went into very quick exponential growth, especially in the beginning of June. And that's closely associated with the increase of prevalence of Delta variant. So the Delta variant increased from the beginning of May to less than 10% of all the genome sequence to the middle end of June to more than 75%. And we always worry when one variant start displacing the other ones, such as the beta variant or even the alpha variant, because what we knew about the beta and alpha is that they were already more transmissible. So what we are being presented here is with a variant that very quickly is dominating the infections in the country, but potentially associated with the very, very fast rate of increase. So we see that in Houteng, we also see that in KwaZulu-Natal in the same way. And in KwaZulu-Natal, we fetch that really in the beginning of our third wave. Initially, we have a peak and there, and that was associated with a lot of infections that arrived from shipping cargo. Yeah, And then after that, in the beginning of May, when our infections were still in the 100 per week, yeah, we start seeing continuous increasing of the Delta variant to completely dominate the infections. But again, very, very fast increase of number of cases. Yeah. So again, the second province that we see the same pattern, increase of, of prevalence of Delta variant and very fast increase of cases. We unfortunately see the same pattern in the Western Cape. Which, which a mixed uh, number of variants with, was dominated by the beta with a spike on the alpha. But as the Delta variant start increasing in the beginning of May, which now is close to 60%, you see again a big increase from less than 100 cases per uh, average case per day to more than 1.5 thousand. Eh? So third province that we see the same, and unfortunately, we see the, exactly the same profile in the Eastern Cape, very fast increase of Delta variant with increase of cases. And then we also see in our last list a uh, sample province, such as the Limpopo, yeah. So what we can paint from that is a very clear picture, yeah, that unfortunately, Delta variant and also in Mapumalanga, which is, is still not that recent data. So what we see is that very clear picture that as the Delta variant increase prevalence of, of infections, it feel a massive and explosive third wave, yeah. So what is, what's, what we know about that Delta variant, yeah. So if we get a close look at, at the genome of the virus, so what we are showing on the top, it is the spike glycoprotein. So that's the main protein that the virus will use to bind the human cell receptor to enter. 
the first thing that we see, we see there one, two, three, four, five, six different mutations and a deletion. The deletion is in a little triangle at in the middle of the green box at position 157 and 159. And what the first thing that we see, these mutations are very different from the beta variant. To be honest, all the mutations are different with the exception of the six. 614G, but these mutations are found in all the variants in the world. So we see a variant with completely distinct mutations. And these mutations are in different area of the, of the virus. Initially, this variant was called the double mutant. Why the double mutant? Because it has two mutations at the receptor binding motif of the receptor binding domain. And these mutations are probably associated with some immune division, but we're gonna get with some more information. It also has some other mutations and the deletions on the non-terminal domain that's also involved with immune evasion. But the mutation that the scientific community worry at the most, it at position 681. And that is the mutation that allowed the virus to, is exactly in the site that he cleavage. What it means, a virus need to cleavage all the protein to make infected variants, yeah? And what we, the scientific community is, is building knowledge is that by having a mutation in that position, allow the virus to become much better at producing variants and potentially infecting cells, yeah? So if you go to the, to, to the next slide, what is here is quite a, a complex slide. So I will take a, a minute to explain to you. We have, we have some graphs that have like the two lines. Yeah. And what we show here in the most extreme area is in the green is what we call the variant B.1351, or this is the beta variant or the 501B2. Uh, found in South Africa. In this graphic, what's tried to put is the relationship between antigenicity. So one thing that we knew is that the beta variant that circulates in South Africa would have very distinct mutations that's showing the protein there, 5017N, uh, 484K, and 501Y. That was the, the, the variant that the whole world worried mostly about being like escape immune pressure which potentially could decrease the the effect of vaccines and that's the main reason one of the main reasons why so many countries put a travel ban in south africa especially when they were increasing vaccinations because they didn't want a variant that could evade uh, immune recognition and potentially decrease the effect of vaccine to be introduced in the country yeah the B.1617.2 is what we call the Delta variant. You still have some level of, uh, of immunity, antigenic immunity, but much less than the beta variant. And we're gonna highlight during this presentation that's potentially one of the reasons why the scientific community is building evidence that this variant, the Delta variant, uh, the vaccines would be more effective than the beta variant that was previously dominating the infection in South Africa. Yeah. So just if we compare here the mutations and just to take you in, in for a few seconds through that, yeah, the beta variants in the bottom, the B1617.2, and then in the, in, in, in the positions there, we show the mutations, what normally we present that. First, the amino acid, the wild type amino acid, falling by the position and the mutant amino acid. Eh? And that's where you can see some of the mutations, such as the position 19 mutated to R, the deletion at 157, 158, and then the mutation that we worry a lot, the 681R. What the world has also found is all these other variants of this variant, where they got quite complex name. For example, the AY.1 is what they call the Delta Plus. Why they call the Delta Plus? Because BASIC have most of the Delta mutations, the B1617.2, plus the 417N. And that's a mutation that we, we normally worry because that's also evolved immune evasion. Yeah. 
So far, the good news is that not very widespread. So at Gizeh, the main database, we have close to 100,000 sequence of the of the beta variant of the delta variant, but very very few of the the a dot a y dot one or a y dot two. What it means the delta plus. So if you go get a look in the in the raw numbers in globally the the delta plus or a y dot one and dot two it represents zero point four percent of the delta variants that have been identified. Yeah, Z less than zero point one percent in the United Kingdom. We're gonna keep talk about the United Kingdom in this presentation. And the main reason is because this variant did this very similar what did in South Africa once arrived in the United Kingdom, very quick dominated close to 95% of the infections. So that's where it's good data. And in South Africa, we found in three of 427 genomes. Uh, we are keeping an eye on this Delta Plus, but so far is that a small prevalence, yeah. So what really happened with a variant that can spread very, very fast, yes, such as the Delta, is that very quick get widely spread around the world. So was this variant was first sampled in India in October 2020, but then in like around seven months, it has spread everywhere in the world, with most of the country that get introduced is starting to dominate, yeah. So for example, in the UK, as I mentioned, it was introduced and displaced the alpha variant with close to 95% of the cases. And in Africa, we already have detection and potentially high prevalence of this variant in Southern Africa, East Africa, Central Africa, and West and North Africa. And very rapidly it's become the dominant strain in many, many countries with 96 countries being identified so far. So what is happening is that the, the, the global prevalence of Delta is increasing rapidly. Okay, and very, very, very quick around the world is becoming almost the dominant global variant, which, which is problematic one because it spread very fast but one of the good news if there is any news about a very fast spreading virus dominating the third wave is that now we can build knowledge that's developed not only in south africa but in the whole world yeah so i will press for my colleague richard lessos which is a, a infectious disease clinician to explain the summary of the delta variant and how it affects transmissibility, disease severity, reinfection, and vaccines. So up to you, Richard. Thanks, Tulio. So hopefully you've got an understanding now of, the, of this Delta variant and of how quickly that is now spreading around the world and really starting to dominate uh, the epidemic in almost all countries around the world. And, and although we say it's only detected in 96 countries, it's, it's very likely that it's higher than that, but that there are gaps in or delays in, in sequencing in, in many of the other countries. And that's particularly the, the case in Africa. So this slide just really summarizes, and what I want to do is just walk you through some of the knowledge that we have at the moment about this variant and, and some of the gaps in the knowledge where we, where we don't yet know uh, precise details of the variant. And, and this is just some of the key aspects when we think about a variant and, and the properties that it has. So in terms of transmissibility, I think, most people logged on to this call will now have heard and understand that this is a highly transmissible variant. And there's now clear evidence that, that this is the most transmissible variant that we've, that we've uh, been exposed to so far. Um, in terms of disease severity, it's an open question at the moment. We don't know whether this variant in itself is associated with more severe disease. In terms of whether somebody can get reinfected with the Delta variant, if they've had a prior infection with 
either the beta variant in the second wave or an older variant in the in the first wave, uh, we don't know whether there's an increased risk of reinfection, but there's some laboratory data to say that um, neutralization is is affected is 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 less uh, with serum from people infected with the beta variant. So that's that the antibodies in in the serum from people infected with beta quite poorly neutralize uh, the delta variant in the laboratory. In terms of vaccines, um, there's no evidence of broad vaccine escape. And we actually have very good evidence, again, as Tulio mentioned, from the United Kingdom, um, that there are high levels of protection against severe disease with this uh, Delta variant. And we'll show you some of the details of, of that. So just to walk through each of these points and, and pick up on a couple of other things, um, in terms of the transmissibility, there's lots of, as you can imagine, with this spreading around the world, as, as Tulio said, now every country is doing the same science uh, to try and understand this variant. And obviously, they're all working with slightly different data. But there's now kind of consistent findings from various analyses that the Delta variant is, is significantly more transmissible than other variants of concern. And that includes the beta variant that we've uh, experienced here and the alpha variant that was quite dominant in, in Europe and North America. And, and we think it may be somewhere like 30 to 60% more transmissible than, than these variants. And if you, if you then compare it to the original virus that emerged out of Wuhan uh, 18 months or so ago, that suggests that Delta is probably around twice as transmissible as, as that virus. So all, that, that was a highly transmissible respiratory virus. We're now dealing with a, a much, much higher uh, transmissible virus. And, and clearly that has implications, not just for community spread, um, but also spread within our, our health facilities uh, and infection control within our health facilities. Now we're dealing with a highly transmissible uh, virus. In terms of the clinical profile, there's a lot of attention paid to this at the moment, and there's different bits of, of data coming out. And obviously, as, as the third wave has taken off in, in South Africa and in Hauteng particularly, there's a lot of clinical experience now building up. Um, and and that, will, that may become more obvious now that the Delta is, is dominant. And it, it'll be interesting to hear thoughts from, from people um, listening tonight to see the, the kind of experience that they have with with patients at the moment but there's there's is some fairly good evidence from the UK and from other settings that the symptom profile may well be different um, and that you may have a more chorizal uh, illness so runny nose sneezing headache um, and that some of the symptoms that we kind of highlighted earlier on in the epidemic, like the loss of taste, loss of smell, uh, may be somewhat less prominent. I think there is still work needed to understand if this is something about the variant, if it has a different uh, tropism for, for different tissues or, or some other behavior that, that's leading to that, or whether it is um, partly reflecting uh, that this variant is, is affecting uh, certain age groups, younger people in the population, whether in some parts of the world it's, it's because it's affecting people who may have had a prior infection or may be partially or fully vaccinated, um, or whether there are different testing practices. But it'll be interesting to see here in South Africa what the experience is and if there's already kind of evidence to suggest that this this is what we're seeing in, in the clinics. Um, in terms of hospitalized cases on the more severe end of the spectrum, I, I don't think there's any evidence at the moment to suggest a different 
clinical profile for those cases uh, or a different profile of, of kind of complications of the severe disease. But again, uh, that's something obviously uh, we'll be following on the on the clinical side and and and, and it'd be great to hear people's uh, uh, frontline experiences of that. In terms of data on severity of disease, I said there's no clear evidence yet. And uh, there's some suggestion from data, both from England and from Scotland separately, um, suggesting that there could be an increased risk of hospitalization with the Delta variant. And there they were able, they're able because of their data systems and because they sequence a, a, a large proportion of the, of the cases, um, they, they could see that there was an increased risk compared with uh, people infected with the Alpha variant. Uh, but that needs more work to, to unpick that again and see if that, uh, if that association remains with, with more time. Um, there's no evidence currently of increased mortality, uh, but that gets complicated to analyze as, as vaccination rollout happens and there's quite high vaccination coverage as this Delta is spreading. And, and as you see in the UK at the moment, most of the uh, infections are happening in the younger unvaccinated uh, population. So it's not straightforward. And I think one of the things we want to highlight again is this question on severity of the variant is to, to some extent an academic question because with the transmissibility advantage that this variant has, um, what you see there, the intensity of the transmission leads to, unfortunately, what we've seen, the intensity of pressure on the health system. And, and that then affects the, the clinical outcomes um, if the health system uh, can't cope with the pressure of admissions. One of the questions that's always asked with these new variants is, is will it impact on, on diagnostics? And, and often you kind of start hearing anecdotal reports of, of people that have tested negative and, but, the, but they have a, a COVID syndrome and, and is, there, is there something happening with the diagnostics? But to the best of our knowledge, um, there's no suggestion that any of the mutations in the Delta variant will affect the performance of either the PCR tests or the rapid antigen tests. There are mutations in, in for example, the, the N gene, which uh, codes for the nucleocapsid protein, which is the target of, of the antigen tests. But um, I haven't seen anything to suggest that that will affect the, the performance or the, or the accuracy of these tests. And it's also worth mentioning that um, some of you will be familiar, the, the alpha variant that, that was first detected in the UK, um, that had this kind of quirk that um, it, it led to target failure on one of the PCR assays, and that made it kind of um, that you could detect the alpha variant just with the standard PCR. But um, this variant, the delta variant, does not have that feature, um, so similar to, to our beta variant. Here's a, a, just to explain what I was talking about. When Tulio showed you that, that picture, he was showing you that the beta variant that we're familiar with from the second wave and the delta variant are quite different. The mutation profile is, is very different and um, they seem to be antigenically quite distinct. And so here, what we're looking at um, is how well the delta variant is neutralized by different serum. So on the top here, you're looking at different variants. So, and, and we should have pointed out on an earlier site, when you see Victoria, it just means one of the earliest um, strains uh, from the epidemic. So essentially a, a, a non uh, variant of concern uh, or variant of interest. And then here you see alpha, beta, gamma, delta. 
Now, here we're taking serum from people infected early in the epidemic. So essentially with the, that were infected not with any of these variants and looking to see how well it neutralizes each of these variants. So you can see, as you'll be familiar with from the beta variant, the beta variant is, is relatively poorly neutralized by that serum. And, and that's what we kind of saw a lot with the, with the beta variant and, and the, the second wave of the epidemic. You can see that there's some reduction in neutralization compared to the Victoria, um, but it's around the same level as the alpha and the gamma, and it's not as, as pronounced as with the beta variant. Now, on the bottom, what we're looking at is the same, the same variants, the same viruses, but here we're taking serum from people that were infected with the beta variant. And we're exposing the different variants to that to the antibodies in in those serum. And here we see that um, although that serum neutralizes well itself, it neutralizes the beta variant well, and there's relatively minimal drop off for the other variants of concern. You see, there's quite a drop off, quite a drop in neutralization for the delta variant. So just to highlight a, a significant reduction in neutralization of Delta by convalescent serum from people infected with the beta variant. So this is laboratory data. It's preliminary, it's one analysis based on a, on a few samples, but it's just to highlight this point that um, it's possible that people with prior beta infection could be susceptible to reinfection. And we need more data to understand this, and we need to start understanding from a clinical perspective again, whether we're seeing any reinfection cases in the, in the clinics and the hospitals. But the public health message is important that um, everybody should still consider themselves susceptible to being infected, whether they were infected previously, uh, and whether that was in the first wave or the second wave or at any time. And it should also be a, a positive message to encourage vaccination in everybody, even if they have had a, a prior infection again. So turning to the vaccines and, and just starting with the laboratory data on, on the vaccines, and this is from the, the same study, I, I should have said, from uh, the, one of the groups in Oxford in, in the United Kingdom. Here they're in the laboratory again with a live virus neutralization assay, and they're looking at how well serum um, from people vaccinated neutralizes the different variants. So on the top, you have the Pfizer vaccine. On the bottom, you have the AstraZeneca vaccine. And again, you have the four variants of concern uh, alongside the kind of early, early strain of the epidemic. So again, you can see for the Delta variant and the Pfizer vaccine, there's some drop off in neutralization if you compare it to the original strain, but it's much less than what's seen with the beta variant. If we look at the AstraZeneca vaccine, it's the same. Um, although there's some drop off for the Delta variant, it's not as marked as the beta variant. And it's more similar to the alpha and the, and the gamma uh, variants. So this is part of the reason that, that we've been saying that um, so far the, the kind of laboratory evidence and some of the clinical data is suggesting to us that um, the Delta variant will be less affected, um, uh, that the vaccines will be less affected by the Delta variant than by the Beta variant. There's neutralization data, I think, coming soon for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, and, and, and so we wait for that with, with interest. But um, what we're seeing with the other vaccines is, is relatively consistent now. And so we expect that that would be the same with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Now, the, the better news is that we have 
good data on vaccine effectiveness. So good quality data, again, from the United Kingdom, um, where, as you know, they're, they're uh, pretty advanced with the vaccination program and with the rollout. And whereas Tulio explained to you, they had a situation not dissimilar to us, where they had complete domination of the epidemic by the alpha variant, who was responsible for over 95% of infections. And then when Delta arrived, it completely took over and has completely replaced alpha. So um, because of this, they're able to, to do some comparisons and look to see uh, what is the vaccine effectiveness against both of these uh, variants. So here you're just looking at the summary kind of statistics of effectiveness of firstly the AstraZeneca vaccine and secondly the Pfizer vaccine. And these are the two vaccines that have been used in the, in the rollout in the UK. And here you're looking at effectiveness after, after the first dose and effectiveness after the full two dose schedule. And then in the white, you're looking at the alpha variant and in the pink, the, the delta variant. And this is looking at effectiveness against severe disease. So against hospitalization, essentially. And what you can see is that even after the first dose, there are high levels of uh, protection against severe disease with both of these vaccines, above 70% uh, effectiveness uh, against the Delta variant. And you can see that essentially there's no difference between uh, the protection against the Delta variant compared to the Alpha variant. If you look after, after the full two-dose schedule, you, you, you get a better protection. So now you're looking at over 90% protection for, the, for both of these vaccines. And again, that's similar, if not even better than against the Alpha variant. So just suggesting that effectiveness against severe disease uh, is, is well maintained in the face of this Delta variant. When you look uh, instead of against hospitalized disease, but against all COVID, so all symptomatic disease, what you see if we start from the right this time, we see that protection against um, all clinical disease uh, is good for, again, both vaccines after the full two-dose schedule. But after the first dose, there's a bit of a drop-off. So, so compared to the alpha variant, the effectiveness seems to be a bit lower for Delta uh, in that period after the first dose. Um, and this is one of the reasons why um, many countries have been pushing now uh, to get the full two-dose schedule in and to make sure that, that everybody's coming back for the second dose so that you get up to this high level of protection uh, against all clinical disease. But the important thing for us in South Africa, the priority at the moment is clearly reducing the severe end of the spectrum and reducing hospitalizations and severe cases. And, and the data are encouraging that the vaccines hold up well in the face of this variant. So just to try and summarize and then hopefully have time for some questions about all of this, um, we can see that Delta is rapidly becoming or has already become the dominant variant uh, all around the world. And South Africa has not been spared and, and it's happening in South Africa and it's, it's replacing the beta variant that has been here now since the second wave. There's very good evidence that it is significantly more transmissible um, than all the other uh, viruses we've seen so far. Um, there is some reduction in neutralization with convalescent serum collected in people that were infected with the beta variant. So that raises some concern about us about possible reinfection, but we need to understand that better both in the, in the laboratory and in the clinic and, the, and, and in the population to, to see whether this is going to be a big problem. 
And although in the laboratory, again, there's some reduction in neutralization with the vaccines, uh, we, we already have good effectiveness data saying that these vaccines offer high levels of protection uh, against severe disease. Um, and that's with both the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca. And as I say, uh, we, will, we will be generating data. The, the Sisonki team will obviously now be generating data around the effectiveness of the vaccine uh, against this Delta variant uh, now that it's uh, becoming dominant in South Africa. So uh, I will stop there and uh, hope that we have time for some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Lessels. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Tulio. We've got uh, some very interesting questions. I think I'm going to try and start with the ones that I think are, are very are pressing. Uh, I think a lot of healthcare workers who were vaccinated with the J&J vaccine are quite anxious about the Delta va variant. Um, and I think a lot have been asking uh, about whether they require a booster with the Pfizer vaccine. Um, you know, uh, just uh, in consideration of, of, of you know, the current, um, you know, variant circulation circulating in South Africa. So what would your, your comment be on that? Yeah, so actually, interestingly, we were just discussing that in another forum, forum today. And, and uh, I think there will be some clearer guidance coming out uh, about that, um, possibly from the Sisonki team or, or from from some other body, but essentially the the consensus feeling here is that there's no data to support that at the moment to support the need for booster doses with mRNA vaccines uh, or with anything else. There's a lot of different research that's that's happening both here in South Africa and elsewhere to look at um, what's what are called prime boost strategies. Um, so where you give one vaccine and then give a different vaccine um, as the second dose. And there will be research looking at uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine followed by another vaccine that may be the Pfizer. But at the moment, and, and as I say, there is data going to come out in the next few days about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, in, at the moment in the laboratory, that, that is still looking, looking good. And it's looking like the protection from that vaccine uh, keeps increasing over time. Um, and, and, and that's something that is often not measured in the initial studies. So, so it takes time to come out that actually the protection um, is very durable and, and becomes stronger over time. So at the moment, the advice is going to be that there's no, no current uh, evidence to suggest the need for boosters or getting the Pfizer dose after the Johnson & Johnson but um, lots of research happening in, in that space that, that will guide us going forward. Thanks, Richard. Uh, anything just, to add? Um, yeah, and just to add to Richard, yeah. So, so what he was mentioning, some, some early data is coming that um, the Johnson Johnson maintain very high level antibody protections through over 200 days, yeah. And, and as we saw with the other two dose vaccines, yeah, even with one vaccination, those they do protect about severe hospitalization. So at the moment, we, we of course, we have to see the data, but, but we, we, we still expect that the Johnson Johnson that was effective to hospitalization and death against the beta variant that's more immunogenic should, should hold through to the Delta variant. And this data will be coming quite soon. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Lessels. I think another question is really around whether there'll be different recommendations around, uh, you know, the non-pharmacological interventions that we've been recommending. For example, uh, you know, uh, the physical distancing, the distance that we've been recommending, considering how highly transmissible that del uh, Delta is. Is 1.5 meters, one meter still, uh, you know, a recommended uh, physical distancing, um, you know, the distance itself? Or should we be saying, please stay away? Uh, this uh, is really going to be uh, something that you don't need to be even 
uh, you know, two meters uh, close to someone who is infected. And also I think there was a question around hand washing, uh, whether, you know, it's effective against uh, Delta. So I think if you can just address just the NPIs and, and whether, you know, there are changes in recommendations uh, with Delta. So, so, so I don't think there's going to be changes in these specific aspects that you, that you mentioned, like these this distance that that we should maintain or the length of time that you have to be in close contact with people, because yeah, these are essentially arbitrary things, arbitrary definitions that are not strongly based on on science about how how much distance you need to spread. And as we've as we've seen through this pandemic, we've 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 learned more about how this virus spreads and how it is essentially um, a, a mix of modes of transmission, but maybe predominantly airborne spread. And we know that what we really need to avoid is being in close contact, in crowded spaces, in poorly ventilated spaces with a large number of people. And so rather than thinking about these kind of definitions based on distance or length of time, we all just need to try harder at really limiting the number of con contacts we make on a day-to-day -day basis um, and limiting the amount of time we spend, particularly in, in crowded, un, poorly ventilated spaces, and, and kind of avoiding the three C's um, is, is still the key kind of public health message as, as to how we um, all do our bit to prevent transmission. Thank you so much for that. Um, there was a question asking, what is uh, what are the ETA and Kappa variants? There was a question on the on the chat. Maybe I, I, I can answer this is that. Julius. <laughs> because uh, yeah, so 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 um, yeah, as part of the World World Health Organization, yeah, and which 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 I'm a member of the Evolution Working Group, we decide to give easier names to these variants. Yeah, so at the moment that is three variants of concern. That's the one that we, we worry mostly about the word. The word that's the alpha, beta, gamma. The gamma is the one causing the big infection in South America, yeah, and the delta. So, so that's the ones that we, we worry a lot. And then there is also what we call variant of interest, yeah. And that's the variants that potentially, if they grow at very high prevalence, yeah, they, they they would become of concern, yeah. And that's where the 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 eta and the cap the kappa they 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 fit in. Yeah? So at the moment, these are a, a variants that that have mutations in the spike proteins or the region of the virus that either decrease a vaccine efficacy or that they, they, they may transmit faster. However, they, they, they are not of concern what it means that we're gonna have sporadic cases, but we haven't seen them grown very, very fast around the world. Thank you. And, and actually, and actually Tulio got something wrong in his presentation and we always pick each other up on, on what we get wrong. But um, if you remember the, the original, uh, information coming out of India of this double mutant. Actually, that double mutant was the Kappa variant, which is called the, the and in the numerical term, it's the B.1.617.1. And so it's similar to the, to the Delta, and it had a mutation at the 484 position, uh, the E484Q. And that worried us because it was similar to, to the mutation in our beta variant. And so that was initially what was called the, the double mutant. Um, and, and then it became clear that actually this similar one, the delta variant, was actually uh, starting to take over infections and, and starting to spread around the world. So, so the kappa is, is similar, but, it, but it's a, a slightly different variant. And, and it doesn't seem to be uh, dominating infections anywhere like the like the Delta. 
Can I ask another question uh, around, um, you know, if, if a person has had an infection, let's say with a beta um, variant uh, and, and in fact, with a delta, with the, in fact, with a beta, and uh, they had it in the past, uh, you know, uh, two months, um, would you still say they are protected against the delta? I think there's been always recommendations around the 90 days so what recommendation would we send out uh, to those people who have um, potentially been infected um, early in the, in the beginning of the third wave when we were still seeing the beta variant uh, circulating? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think the, the issue of reinfection is a difficult one. And, and it's very difficult to understand how much reinfection is really happening. Be and, and that's partly because we think that um, even if reinfections with these variants are happening, they may have very mild or, or asymptomatic disease because although all the data we show you, we show you the kind of neutralizing antibody data, but we, ne we don't tend to show you the T cell data and the T cells are another part of the immune system that kind of mediate the, the disease presentation and the disease severity. And what we know from a lot of work at, at UCT with Wendy Burgers and, and, and Tobacco and Tuzi and, and, and their teams is that these variants, certainly the beta variant, um, uh, they, they, the, the T cell response is not affected as much by the variation in, in the virus. And, and so even if people are reinfected, um, it's a little bit like uh, people who are infected after vaccination, we expect that those infections will be predominantly the, the very milder end of the spectrum and that you won't see uh, so much at the severe end of the spectrum. And, and that's also what makes it difficult to study. And, and the reality is we still don't really know, even for the beta variant, how much reinfection that caused, how, how many people um, were reinfected with the beta variant after having been infected in the first wave. And I, I suspect it's gonna be the same here that we'll, we'll see cases of reinfection, we'll hear reports of, of people being reinfected with probably with the Delta variant, but understanding it at a, at, at a level of the population and, and, and how it's, influencing the epidemic is is much more complicated yeah but but just to add to richard uh, one thing that i personally worry which which unfortunately we have seen some hospitals yeah is this assumption especially from healthcare professionals that if they have been infected or vaccinated they they, they are kind of protected against reinfection yeah and 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 that can be quite problematic, especially in a, because it can drive nosocomial transmission inside the hospitals. Yeah. And at the moment is a little bit of confusion about if you have been vaccinated or previously infected. Yeah. What, what is, what you should do if you get exposed and what kind of level of protection you should do not only to, uh, to, to avoid yourself to develop mild disease, what's likely if you have been recently reinfected or vaccinated, but also potentially to, to transmitting disease to others. Yeah, I don't know what Richard think about that. <laughs> yeah, and, and that also, these things also depend on what the level of vaccination coverage is in the country, so, because what you're talking, what what you do is depend, kind of is dependent on whether you might still get infected and whether you might pass it on to someone else. And and there we're worried about you passing it on to somebody who's vulnerable, who's at, at risk of severe disease. And so until you get a level of vaccination coverage where you're protecting most of those people who are who are at high risk of severe disease then you should still be doing most of the same things that you've been doing uh, as, as a public health level again. And, and obviously, it's, so it's marrying up what you do as an individual. Uh, of course, once you're vaccinated, you want to have a bit more freedom. 
um, but that also has to come at a public health level that that you want to to have as many people protected as possible before you start kind of relaxing some of the some of the requirements. Do you think that the recommendations around, you know, the 10 day isolation and quarantine, uh, you know, would uh, need to be reviewed with the Delta variant uh, being in circulation? Nothing to suggest that. So, so we don't we don't have anything to suggest that this uh, that it's more transmissible because it because it because people remain infectious for longer. It's it's a possibility, but it it's not thought to be the mechanism for why this is so much more transmissible. So there's nothing at the moment to suggest the need to extend that. Um, again, that that was still a kind of open question with the other variants of concern, and um, I, I I don't think we'll see that change. I, I doubt we'll get the evidence to to say that that needs to change. Thank you so much. There was another question around uh, how soon after a person has been infected with COVID would they then get their first dose of the vaccine? I did, I think, answer. Uh, there was a, a circular that was released in terms of the 30 days. I don't know if you can confirm that as well. So it is 30 days, just making sure that everyone else has seen the, the, the circular that was uh, sent out by, I think, the deputy DG to that effect. So we have run out of time. It's always great uh, to have a discussion. Um, I think uh, Delta is here. And uh, I think we, we're really grateful that you came and shared all the insights. It empowers the clinicians to know, um, you know how to deal with some of these uh, questions because the patients will ask. So Prof uh, Tulio, thank you so much uh, for, for, for really sharing your insights today. Dr. Lessels, it's always a pleasure. I enjoy you guys coming through because we always learn a lot. Uh, before you leave, uh, please remember we do have a poll. Uh, please share your feedback with us so that you know how you experience this uh, webinar and it helps us in planning uh, for future webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, you joining us uh, today. Uh, Till next week, uh, have a good night.